ranting about this whole notion of repetition over and over again. And so it would be nice if, and I think I've mentioned this before, it would be nice if someone came up with some, some automated way of, um, of doing what I always do on a daily basis, right? I'm, I'm always uh, fishing around with scripts and, you know, recording these things and whatnot. This could be automated. You know, I just open my machine, I double click on an application and then it starts doing what I do, right? This is what, in part, what we are trained to do, is it? Not to use Microsoft Word, but, uh, so we, we are transitioning to lecture series number 23. We are done now with uh, uh, MIPS assembly, right? Uh, I do believe we've gotten to a stage where we have an appreciation of, of, of what happens behind the scenes when you implement a computer application using a high level programming language and then you compile it, for instance. The instructions, because when you compile it, it's converted into a form that a computer is able to understand and execute, right? And so what we, we, we are from looking at is the instructions that the computer executes, but then abstracted in a form that we're able to understand, right? Uh, we now know what happens. So lecture series number 23 is building up on what we just did. Uh, MIPS data part. Can you hear me now, Josephine? Yes. Okay. MIPS that she complained bitterly, right, the other day, saying, you whisper, you don't, uh, I shall be shouting now. So MIPS data path and control. Uh, but before we start, I just wanted to mention that I, I just realized that I said that this makeup thing was supposed to be available on Friday, but no, it's Sunday. We've tightened the noose here because of what was happening. So it shall be available today, and then it's due tomorrow at 23.59. So you have like 24 hours to do this. Um, and then uh, October 11th is, uh, is uh, the test, right? So I would prepare if I were you. Uh, so this, this is going to be a relatively short lecture series, I think. I don't think we'll go beyond like uh, a week or like three or four lecture series, but nonetheless. I, I thought it's dentally, right? The, the reason why I thought it was nice, blessing in disguise for us to have the makeup is, um, I, I thought we'd do like a quick revision, start off with quick revision of some of the things that we looked at that are closely related to what we're going to be talking about. And the reason I'm, I'm trying to do this is uh, uh, trying to remind people that everything we're doing is connected. Try to see if people remember some of the things we're going to talk about here. But the outlines as follows, just an intro and then, um, so suppose we're mixed. MIPS memory organization, but just a, a review of what we spoke about in lecture series number 20, I believe it was 21, uh, because 19 was uh, really more about elements of um, MIPS assembly language, right, and whatnot, and a rundown of how QTCPM is supposed to be used. Um, and then we just want to get an appreciation of the so-called uh, single, single cycle CPU data path and my, um, multiple, or otherwise called the pipeline uh, CPU data path um, granted, or bearing in mind that our discussion up to this point in time was making the assumption that the instructions were, were, were being executed using a single, single cycle CPU data path, right? So instructions executed in sequence or sequentially, which is really not, not generally the case. In an ideal case, what happens on your machine is your instructions are executed in parallel, right? Simultaneously, not one at a time. Right, and we'll look at an example to try and exemplify this. And, and then I just wanted to mention up front that our discussion on this so-called data path and control is just going to res be restricted to the core components that are involved here. And the reason we are doing this is because the lecture series that comes after this is in part going to look at uh, how, you know, you can, you can make use of fundamental building blo blocks, so-called logic gates to build some of these hardware components, right? Uh, and then at that stage, we would have been done because that's our interest in so far as abstraction of the computer system is concerned. We're saying we, we don't care how the circuitry is actually implemented, the hardware, how you know those things are implemented. We don't care how buses, how the design of buses is actually done. What we're interested in is just uh, all the way up to the uh, so-called the logical layer, right? The logic gates. Just try and see how those fundamental building blocks get to implement some of the things we've been talking about and things we're going to talk about in here. Uh, and then what I thought would be interesting would be for us to trace example instructions in the so-called data path, so to see exactly how um, 
once decoded how, let's say, an R formatted instruction, um, what sort of, so what sort of path it follows as the computer is executing the instruction, right? What, what hardware components are involved? It turns out that when you're dealing with an R format instruction, the hardware components that you tend to use are different from those used when you're dealing with an I format instruction, right? Uh, so things like, things like the sign extend will come up again. Uh, and we know, we've already found out that the R format instruction doesn't really make use of um, sign extend component, for instance. And then we we'll summarize. So here's the thing, guys, right? I mentioned this last time, but I wanted to remind you that everything we're talking about, our discussion centered around the data path and these instructions, the ISA architecture, so-called ISA architecture, everything is happening on the CPU, right? That small little thing here, like this is blown out, the thing that sits somewhere here, this is a heat sink here, the socket, right? So heat sink is up, up above. Um, but this small little thing here, so when we're saying you know, a computer is executing these instructions, the execution is actually happening here, just a reminder here. So-called uh, arithmetic and logic units, they are all in here, right? Um, program counter is in here. If this, if this CPU was, uh, if this CPU implemented MIPS, we'd expect there to, to be 32 integer registers in here, right? So everything is happening within the CPU. Uh, it's unfortunate that Nonde hasn't done the, hasn't ripped apart the, the, the thing, the, uh, the machine that we have somewhere lying around. I should follow up with him. I don't know why he was supposed to have done this before he transitioned to other tutorial series. Right, so yeah, everything is gonna happen in here. And again, our discussion during lecture series number six of the CPU cycle, the machine cycle, or so-called instruction cycle, um, involved the discussion of these four key steps, right, that are involved when executing an instruction. Um, so we discussed this, but, but we now know that, uh, in fact, when we are making reference to these so-called instructions, the things that we're talking about are things like add, in the case of MIPS, right, add, sub, j, jal, jr, right? Of course, I mean, those things um, come with corresponding operands, right? But these are the things we're talking about, the instructions. So when we're saying, oh, instruction is fetched, decoded, and executed, this is what we're making reference to. Um, and, and really, we had an appreciation of what happens to this so-called software as we're executing it. Yes, Fraser. Yes. 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 No, no, it's like it's an example. It's a, it would have to be an actual instance. Yeah. Depend on how a question is phrased. Like, so if you were asked to say, can you give an example of a type of instruction, MIPS instruction, a category of MIPS instruction, then you know that you're talking about like I format, R format, or J format. But if a question says, uh, give a specific example of an instruction, these are the things we're talking about here. Add, BGT, BOT, SLT. Granted, some of those are pseudo instructions, right? So answer would be different if you say, give an example of a bare instruction. What is an example of a bare instruction? I don't know, right? Yeah? Okay, yeah, add is the easiest one, right? <laughs> but but so guys, something else you probably have not figured out yet, hopefully you have, is that Really, besides the different categories we spoke about with regards to MIPS, you realize that our discussion of these so-called instructions can be refactored into these three broad categories. So there are instructions that are specific for arithmetic and logical things, operations. BGT, logical operation. Well, arithmetic operations, MOT. What else? Yeah. Div, yeah. So interesting. This thing is a marvel, right? Uh, if, if we went back in time and told them to say, this small little thing does everything, it can, it, 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 you know, when you're using this thing here, what actually, what's actually happening behind the scenes is you're performing rudimentary arithmetic operations. And I'm sure mom and dad would think you're crazy, or maybe it would be hard for them to understand, right? Yes. 
blockchains are native and decryption? No, that's for flow control. Those are like for, um, in fact, they, they fall under instructions used for flow control because you are, you are, you are altering the, the flow of the program. Remember uh, what we said when, when we made mention of the fact that, in fact, the execution of these so-called instructions when you have a program, let's say 1,000 lines of code, execution is top to bottom, left to right, right? Is it left to right, top to bottom? So the instructions are in fact executed one line at a time, but you can alter that default flow of execution, right? By using program constructs like J, right? You jump to a particular address. Uh, branch, for instance, and conditional branch, or conditional branching using BGT, B, BOT, uh, BQ, BNE, right? All those things here. Uh, but, but really, the logical, the logical instructions that we can use as examples, we didn't really look at in depth. So these would be things like, uh, if you have looked at, if you've bothered to look at, uh, if you, the homework that was in lecture series number 21, you'd have come across op 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 operations like and, A, N, right? Or, right? Those are the logical uh, instructions we're talking about, right? Uh, but anyway, granted. Um, and then we briefly glossed over some memory-centric instructions, like, I mean, load immediate would probably fall in here, but load word, store word, you know, things of that nature. Right. And really something else to mention with regards to these instructions is our discussion was centered around uh, um, instructions, uh, instructions associated with core processor <coughs> zero, right? So we're looking at instructions that manipulate integers, right? We, we didn't really bother so much about core processor one, but if you're interested, I'm sure, I'm sure people have come across this. For you to perform, um, if you're using, if you're wanting to use uh, a branch instruction with a float or a double, you actually have to prefix your instruction. There's an instruction that's prefixed with a C, right? C dot, right? You've seen that. So if you're curious, and I'm sure, has anybody bothered to compare uh, floats? Like, like if you wanted to create a program that checks if an input value is greater than 22.5. 22.5 is a floating point number, right? I mean, you could choose to use double precision if you want, you know, to, to handle more, more, um, more uh, values after a decimal point, in which case you're using like 64 bits instead of 32 bits. But what I was referring to is if you bothered, probably you haven't, but I, just to exemplify what I'm saying here, um, I'm using mines because it, it has an autocomplete feature. I just want to show you something, which hopefully, as, as we are waiting for this to load, somebody had a question, yes? Mm -mm. It's not always the case. And this is, a, this is an interesting question, right? You're talking about two different things. I don't know if people understand this question. Yeah? He's, he's saying, uh, can, you, can you, I don't know if you can see here, by the way, this is like c.eq.d. So I'm performing a comparison using double precision. I'm trying to check if, uh, if two numbers, two doubles, right, using double precision, two doubles are equal each other, so like if 22.0 is equal to whatever input comes through. His question is, um, would you say uh, our format instructions are actually arithmetic and logical instructions? That's what he's saying, no. And we can cite examples here. Add I, what type of instruction is it uh, out of the three? A, this, B, this, C, this. What is add I? What? Yeah, but, but is it an arithmetic and logical instruction? Is it a flow control instruction? Does it fall under memory centric instructions? Yeah. So you see that add I and add will still all be classified under this. So you, you can't, these are two different things you're talking about. Okay. <clears throat> and, and then we, we had a, so our discussion of this so called instruction cycle, the machine cycle, right? We, we discussed this. And at, at that point, I'm, I'm guessing people were 
things are a bit you know, hazy and whatnot, but now we know what was happening behind the scenes, right? But a refresher here, uh, initially you have this program, you fire up like Ocular, the one I'm using to beam up the slides. It sits on secondary storage, computer storage, right? AKA my hard disk in this case, but it could be a thumb drive, right? When I double click on it, it's going to go into RAM, right? My computer will move it into RAM, right? When I run it, when I execute it, it goes into RAM. And it is from within RAM that the CPU starts getting or fetching instructions associated with that particular application, in this case, Ocular, right? So one instruction at a time, like granted, Ocular has thousands of lines of instructions, thousands of them, right? Same goes for Chrome or Firefox or, or the Android apps that you like using, right? A lot of instructions, but once they are loaded into RAM, the CPU executes them one line at a time. And what's actually happening is during the fetch cycle, <coughs> CPU goes and gets the instruction in RAM, takes it to the CPU. Once it gets to the CPU, it has to be decoded so that the CPU knows exactly what it needs to do. Because once it fetches it, it doesn't know what needs to happen, right? So it decodes it, and then once it figures out, oh, this is an add instruction, or this is a, 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 a branch instruction, then it executes that instruction. And then after execution, typical on the ALU, um, what happens is the result has to perhaps be stored into memory at some point, right? Fetch decode cycle, very simple, right? But the key takeaway point is the things that you're fetching are actually these things here, one at a time, right? Um, and also, we, we actually, still in lecture series number six, we, we actually spent time looking at the subcomponents on the CPU, the important components, which we, we, we said they were important at the time anyway, important components of the CPU that are involved during this so-called fetch, decode, execute cycle. Specifically, what we focused on are uh, the control unit, the arithmetic and logic unit, um, and really the memory unit, right? So we, know, we, we actually, discovered that the control, the control unit is the one that's uh, responsible for, it fetches, so it issues like an instruction, a control instruction, say I want to fetch a particular memory by specifying the address, right? That uh, instruction or data will be fetched from memory and then it will be decoded by the control unit. Um, and then afterwards, ALU we, uh, will perform some sort of execution once the uh, control unit figures out exactly what needs to be done. Um, and then the cycle begins again, you store that thing. You're going in a loop, right? As you're, and this is all happening as you're, as you're, you know, uh, oh, click here, print, file, print, the instructions associated to all those different functionalities. You understand this? This is very important because you need to understand what's going on behind the scenes before you can actually go and sit down and learn how to program. Yes? So you said here that um, the store is instructions. Um, the loading part of the No, it's not a store instruction. What you're doing when you're loading is you're saying, what you're doing with load immediate actually is you're, you're saying implicitly, you're saying go to memory, go and get this data, load it into this register. And so you're fetching something from memory. And in fact, we, we did make mention of the fact that load immediate is a pseudo, LI is a pseudo instruction actually. So it has to be translated to it's like a bare instruction, right? But, but what you're doing is you're actually going to RAM you fetch the instruction and then you dump it into the specified register. Um, so you're not storing there, you're actually reading from memory, reading the contents of memory. And of course here, the, 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 the idea of memory here is a bit, uh, we're, we're trying to draw a line between RAM and registers. We do know that registers are temporal memory storage locations, right? But specifically, the question you just raised is, Memory is RAM, right? So we are reading from RAM, but we're eventually going to store into a different memory location, which is like a register, right? A temporal storage location. So it could be like, I perceive to be both actually, right? Okay, uh, and then hopefully guys, uh, I hope you remember what we did here. You remember when we simulated a couple of instructions? Um, when we were saying, well, what's happening to this uh, PC as you are going through that cycle, right? I thought I would take us back uh, number one, because a disclaimer here, we're trying to abstract what was happening. In fact, these instructions I was specifying here, you notice that this is certainly not a MIPS instruction now, is it? Um, it's like, it's, it was a hypothetical kind of 
instruction. I think it, this could be like x86, x, x86 probably does have an add uh, where you specify the ad address. I think I, I could be wrong, but just trying to point out here that because we hadn't yet got into a stage where we knew exactly how these instructions are formatted, we, we had to just make up these instructions. Say, there is an instruction that is involved with loading a value. And for you to load a value, you just specify the load instruction and the corresponding address where you wish to load that thing to. Right, there's an add instruction where you specify the address of the value that you wish to add. And in fact, the add, we mentioned this, the add here was adding the value corresponding to address number four in this case, which is nine, to the accumulator, right? But we, we, we simplified things. If we, we had used MIPS instructions here, the, uh, like the values would have here would, com would be completely different here. But it doesn't take away the, the fact that we, we did this to understand what happens during the instruction cycle. Specifically, our focus was on these sub-hardware components. And really, if you think about it, all these things are nothing more than registers. So we, we narrowed our focus for this particular discussion on the special purpose register, PC, my program counter, memory address register, memory buffer, or memory da data register, right? Current instruction register. And, and we're just trying to kind of get an appreciation of what's actually happening when you're going through this process, right? But now we know. And hopefully if we substituted this with uh, MIPS, we'd be able to, to redo this somehow. Yes. How, how many can do this? I know I can, but I don't know. Only one person can do this. If you were to replace instructions with MIPS specific instructions, would you be able to kind of like uh, simulate what happens to these different hardware components? Okay, that's good. So then it's everybody in class. But, so, right, so like I said, right, this, the discussion, I mean, these things when we're talking about instructions and whatnot, we were making the assumption that um, execution of these so-called instructions is done one at a time, sequentially. Uh, and that, that process is what's referred to as a single cycle um, CPU data path, right? Where, um, remember when, uh, if, if you think about what's happening here, uh, you fetch, you decode, you execute, you store, with a single cycle CPU data path, the assumption you're making is that if you have uh, two instructions as a part of the program that has two instructions, if what you will do is you will first of all execute the one instruction. So you fetch it, you decode it, you execute it, and then you store whatever result uh, into memory, and then you move on to the next instruction. That's a single cycle data path. But in actual fact, if you think about it, it would be very slow. Your machine would be very slow if you, you did that, right? Um, and so MIPS, um, MIPS and, and in fact, most of these uh, instruction set architectures uh, implement what's called either multi-cycle multi, multi -cycle CPU data paths or pipeline data paths, right? Where you execute these instructions um, sequentially, right? I mean, sorry, uh, in parallel, essentially. Uh, it's like, um, it's like, um, oh, I don't know when you do your laundry, but I do my laundry on the weekend, right? When I'm doing my laundry, usually it's early in the morning, but what I do early in the morning, I also have to prepare breakfast. What I do is I don't, I don't first of all say, I will do my laundry and then or I'll do my breakfast and then after I finish my breakfast, I eat and then I do my laundry. In fact, what I do is I do things in parallel, right? I start cooking my breakfast and then uh, in the process, maybe I'm heating water and whatnot, uh, and then I start doing my laundry. So I start doing things in parallel. If you think about it, I end up doing things much faster. I get to do those two things in, in a uh, significantly uh, lower uh, time frame than I would if I did them one at a time. The, 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 same, the same logic here is what's, what's really linked to what's called the multi-cycle CPU data path or pipeline data path. So you're 
wanting to execute instructions um, instructions um, in parallel. Now, what I would like us to do, by the way, as part of homework, yeah, and we all know what this means, it's homework, please do this. We know that one of the key things, the advantage of uh, a pipelined uh, CPU data path or a multi-cycle data path is efficiency. So you get to execute more instructions because you're executing them in parallel. Uh, so as part of homework, let's go and uh, do a bit of research on what other advantages exist, uh, what other advantages we can link to, to this, or, uh, and also disadvantages. There are a number of disadvantages, by the way. Think about this for a second. There are a number of disadvantages, right? So let's go and look this up, by the way. Um, and, and I know what you're thinking. You're like, but wait a minute, Lighton. Why is it that you're saying, oh, uh, why is it that you're saying, uh, why, why are you saying efficiency? Why do efficiency when your machine, for instance, has a, a, a maximum what? Execution instructions, how many instructions per second? 1.8 billion instructions per second. Why would you want to, why would you want the machine to be more efficient than it already is? Because this machine does a lot behind the scenes. Right, so if, if this was right, like if this was a single, um, if, if this particular is x86, if this was like a, a single uh, cycle CPU data path that was implemented using single cycle CPU data path, what will happen is, uh, you'd only be able to execute, uh, at any given point in time, um, you'd be executing, uh, I guess it would be, I guess it would be one over 1,000, one point, ooh, this is, okay. So it would be one over 1 1.8 billion, right? Uh, instructions in how many minutes? So uh, my computer, right, CPU maximum speed, right? Is, um, is what, 1.8 gigahertz. So what this means is that this machine is able to execute 1.8 billion instructions per second. With that, you can compute how long it would take to, com to execute one instruction, right? If you know how, if we're saying you can execute 1.8 billion instructions, then the inverse of that is, is the time frame required to execute one instruction. It's like, a, I mean, you couldn't possibly conceive how fast that is, right? But, but the key takeaway point is that, that that number, that throughput is still not, it's, it's not enough, right? Uh, it, can be, it can be reduced further by making use of pipelining, that's what we're saying. Do you understand this? <coughs> My machine, we just checked, 1.8 or 1, instructions per second, right? So we know that X instructions will be equal to one over, so, um, oh, oh, this is uh, one instruction, one second, one second. Uh, one instruction is, is just going to be equal to uh, one over, one over one point, one over one eight. Is this making sense? What I'm saying is, uh, and this is like a small number here, right? Uh, it's like, one over one eight zero zero, one two three, one two three. So, yeah, I don't know, I can't even look at, so, I, I'm able to, one instruction is executed in this, in this time frame here, these are seconds, but you can probably convert this to milliseconds or nanoseconds or whatnot if you want to, right? So one instruction is executed like, so what we're saying is, even, even if using a single cycle data path, this is the amount of time it would take to execute one instruction, you want to reduce this time even further by pipelining, right? And the way that you reduce it is by executing instructions at the same time, in parallel. Hopefully this makes sense about uh, the execution. What should I buy? Should I buy one point? Oh, it's, they're saying it's uh, one point, it's one, it's two megahertz. 
This is like, I don't know who is calling you. Should I buy this machine? It's one megahertz CPU. And uh, the other one says uh, two gigahertz. You should be able to tell them, oh, get the two gigahertz, right? But, but of course, I mean, the comparison is not done like that, obviously. You know that the, those, those, absolute, those values, when you're dealing with different uh, processors, you couldn't possibly compare those two values, right? They're not the same. Okay, so, so but, but let's, let's look at what's happening here behind the scenes to get an appreciation of, of what, what happens when you pipeline the instructions, right? Um, this is such an important concept that elsewhere, I guess, in certain courses, it's discussed in depth, right? But we're just glossing over to get an appreciation. So imagine a situation where you have uh, a program that has these, it's made up of these five instructions, right? And we know what's happening here. We're just going to print, um, 2019, right, onto the console. So if this is a program we've implemented, we know that uh, once we execute it, what the computer will do is it will load this into RAM, and then from within RAM, um, for, for the user to see the effect of printing the, the number two, 2019 onto the console, each of these individual instructions will be executed one at a time by the CPU. Right. Um, but with a single, with a single um, CPU data path, what actually happens behind the scenes is uh, obviously this program has already been loaded into RAM, but um, CPU or con con uh, control unit will go and fetch the first instruction. So first instruction will have to go through those different cycles. Fetch, decode, execute, store, right? This is represented by here, right? Write back, and this is memory access, this is execution, this is instruction decode, instruction fetch. So with a single cycle CPU data path, what's happening is in each clock cycle, clock cycle number one, fetch. So you will fetch instruction number one. Clock cycle number two, remember the clock cycles we're talking about here is uh, th that value we're saying two megahertz or two gigahertz, that's a clock cycle, right? How fast the CPU actually does, it's like a clock speed anyway. How fast the CPU performs those, those particular computations. So in, in, in each of those, every, please let me know if you don't understand it. Every time this happens, every after 5.5 to the power uh, negative 10 seconds, it goes through the, the, the different the, the sort of different cycles we're talking about, right? <clears throat> um, so in 5.5, 5.5 to the power 10 minus 10, uh, it will instruction <coughs> fetch. This is done left, right, top, bottom, right? So it comes here, it will fetch this. Clock cycle number two, uh, control unit will decode this to try and figure out what it needs to do. Remember these are ones and zeros, by the way, these are not like ones and zeros. So it decodes the one and zero to figure out what needs to be done. Clock cycle number three, it executes, it now knows that it needs to add, uh, it needs to essentially what you're saying, add or load this volume to the register, right? Uh, and then clock cycle number four, so you execute this, sorry, clock cycle number four, if there's any memory access required, then you'd access memory, right? Like for instance, if we had, if we had uh, defined this 2019 into the data section and then we say, oh, load this first, uh, we'd, we'd be accessing memory, but since, no memory access is required, there'll be like a write back to the register, right, WB. Uh, so you notice that we go through one, two, three, four, five. In all those five cycles, we are dealing with this one instruction. After the fifth cycle would have done processing this instruction, essentially would have loaded this into register number eight. And then we move to uh, uh, the second instruction, which is instruction number two. You do the same thing. You fetch the instruction first, so that would be like uh, clock cycle number six. You decode the instruction, clock number seven. You execute number eight. Uh, if there's any memory access, no memory access, it'd be number nine. Then number 10, you write back to the register, right? Which is there here, because you're putting the value in register number nine. Um, and then you, you do the same thing with three, four, and five. You notice that at the point where we, we are we are, we are done processing, processing, um, processing uh, instruction number two, would have gone through a total of 10 CPU cycles. 
for a single uh, CPU data path. And you do this really for all the instructions associated with the program that you're you running. So this is what I was explaining here, right? This is like uh, very tedious. And so you do the same for all the different instructions until you're done. And really you're essentially going in a loop because half the time, right, like for, for, um, <clears throat> for your phone, I'm sure there are certain applications that are always open or something, like WhatsApp. Like typically they're always in RAM somewhere, right? And every time you initiate like an action, let's say you want to send a message, the instructions associated with sending a message um, or writing that message will be fetched from RAM, right? And data as well, and then processing happens behind the scenes. So essentially we're in a loop. Uh, and seeing as we never switch off our phones, at least I don't, uh, don't remember when last I switched off my phone, um, there's always something happening on the machine, phone, right? In fact, I don't switch off my phone, it's just on stand, my, my computer is always on standby. But so this is, uh, this is the so-called single cycle CPU data path. But what about the so-called uh, pipeline data path, right? What actually happens behind the scenes? Notice that with pipelining, what you're essentially doing is you're saying, well, I, I want to take advantage of the fact that when I fetch the first instruction, I know that the next step is going to be, in the next CPU cycle, I'll have to decode that instruction. But seeing as the hardware components that are involved with fetching are essentially free at this point in time, what I can do is, at the time when I'm decoding the first instruction, what I can do is I can also fetch the second instruction. So essentially, in cycle number two, I would be, I would be decoding the first instruction, and then I would be fetching this, I would be decoding the first instruction, and then I would be fetching the second instruction. And then I do the same thing in the third cycle, where I'm saying, fine, in the, th in the third cycle, the first instruction is being executed, the second one is now being decoded, which, well, what, 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 when I'm executing the first instruction, the components involved with decoding the instruction are free. So I can decode the second instruction. When I'm decoding the second instruction, um, the components involved with fetching are free. So I can fetch the third instruction, right? And so you notice that uh, cycle number one, cycle number two, cycle number three, cycle number four, cycle number five, and if you count this, in cycle number five, I would have, well, cycle num let's, let's go to cycle number five, cycle number six. In cycle number six, I would have executed two instructions in just six cycles. But in, in a single cycle uh, CPU data path, it took us 10 cycles to execute one instruction. Do you understand this? I know I do. But, um, right, so if this makes sense, hopefully, uh, we can transition to this good stuff, right? There's, there's actually a lot that happens behind the machine. Here's to hoping some people in here might uh, become hardware engineers somewhere, right? These days, uh, the entry barrier to finding yourself in these, some of these exotic places has become so low. You can find yourself as some, some person who does low-level stuff for some, I guess, some top-notch company like Intel. It is possible. In the past, I have crossed paths with uh, very brilliant students, um, previous life. Uh, this one student uh, is working with Microsoft. Someone just like you, right? When I was a graduate student, I interacted with this person because uh, she, she was helping out with um, certain aspects of the project, one of the projects I was working on in Microsoft. So you can do this, it's doable, right? We should aim to do this. There's a question from Fraser. And maybe we can set up a, a, companies that manufacture these hardware components in Zambia or something. Why not? <laughs> yes. On the what? Why is it not what? Oh, so because you see the this question is why can't we fetch at the same time? Because when you're fetching an instruction, if you think about what happens when you're fetching an instruction, there are certain key hardware components that you're using, right? Do you remember? When you're fetching an instruction, what happens? PC needs to keep track of what's happening 
you know, address of the current instruction has to go into the CIR. There's only one CIR, so you can't fetch multiple instructions at the same time. Well, I, I guess the things change if you're dealing with uh, multi-core um, multi processors, right? But, but that's, that's a completely different discussion here. We're just assuming it's like a single core machine. You could do that if you're dealing with a multi-core processor. Uh, and and hopefully, I, I hope you, you, you're able to link different aspects together. This question from Fraser, really good question here. The, the fact that people are constantly trying to figure out how fast they can make the computer uh, execute instructions, which is why they came up with you know, multi-core processors, which is why they've come up with, uh, they, they eventually at some stage they came up with uh, pipelined uh, data pads, right, so that you're executing instructions simultaneously. If you read up on, if you go back to the lecture series where we discuss the different generations of computers, I'm sure like first generation and second generation computers were probably making use of like a single uh, cycle CPU data pad, right? So you're literally executing one instruction at a time, which is why they were slow. But fast forward to the 21st century or like, uh, you know, um, the, I guess early 2000s and whatnot, and people have come up with ingenious ways of trying to make things much faster. Faster RAM. More components on the CPU. Um, faster CPUs. People even do crazy things like, uh, and I hope people that game here have read up on, oh, I'm going to clock my machine or something, right? Make it much faster. You can do that, but uh, uh, prepare for whatever this. Um, outcome might, might, might come your way, might mess up your machine. And if it's under warranty, then they won't accept it. But, so you notice that uh, uh, with, with a, a, a thing, like I said, this is a classic example of what's actually happening here, just walking through the process of executing one instruction. <coughs> For simulating one instruction doesn't, like you wouldn't get an appreciation of, of the, the advantage of of, of a pipeline data path if you're just looking at one instruction, but if you think of it from the perspective of at what point, or how many cycles would you go through if, uh, by the time you go to cycle number 10 or cycle number six, so cycle number 10. Cycle one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there's 10. By cycle number 10, this particular design would have executed all five instructions. One, two, three, four, five, done. But by cycle number 10 in here, we would have only executed one instruction. One, two, three, or two instructions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, right? Do you understand this? Yes, sir. That goes after instruction execution. Where? Yeah, Yes. Yes, 2019 is the data actually, yes. Because there, the difference between, so the computer do that in different ways. What do you mean? Like the data and the instructions. Does it what? Does it process it differently or the same? No, we'd have to uh, define what you mean by processing. How, how do you mean by processing? Like how does it view it? Well, the, the computer views this particular, the instruction line number one, it views it as a stream of ones and zero, and we can decode this easily, right? Try to understand what your question is here. Yeah, Do you want to provide like a, a, a complementary example of what you like? Yes, yes. Uh, they are playing a song and they are also working with software. Uh huh. So they are dealing with data. Yes. Yeah, and they are working with software now, they are dealing, they are dealing with lines of code. Well, think about this for a second. I'll pause for your question. I still don't understand this, but whatever it is you're doing on your machine, you're dealing with both instructions and data. Can you give me an example of a, uh, like what you'd be doing on a machine where you'd not be dealing with data? Give us an example. You use a machine because you're trying to process data. Think about this. Do you think there's anything that you could find yourself doing on a machine that doesn't involve using data? It's just a type of data, right? When you're using like a media player, you're dealing with audio. When you're writing code using a notepad, you're dealing with textual data. Okay, let's say a song comes with lines of code. 
But the song is, what, what happens when you're playing a song here is, uh, what media player do you use? VLC, do you use VLC? VLC. So you open, for you to play the song, you have to op open VLC. VLC is the program. That program will be loaded into memory. And typically once you open VLC, start, open. You go to file, open. When you say open, you navigate to where that MP3 file is, or OGG file is. The moment you select it, you only play it once you select it. Once you select it, you're dealing with data. The instructions you're working with are instructions associated with VLC. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, what about the two things? They do happen at the same time. So you. Because we said that one instruction is suited one after the other, but now we are doing two things at the same time. Whatever it is you're doing on the machine, well, for the most part, most of the things that are perceived by a human being, uh, it's one, one at a time. You can, it's, well, sure, I guess I see what you mean here. There is. Um, we, we didn't discuss this during our, our, our discussion of operating systems. Um, there's um, scheduling, there's this notion of scheduling. Think about this more for a second. We're saying one for my machine, 1.8 billion instructions in any given second. So what would happen if you are playing music and watching a video at the same time is uh, within 5.5, within Five point five uh, uh, times ten to the power negative oh times e to the power negative ten. I will probably be executing an instruction associated with uh, the video player. In the next cycle, right? You're scheduling, you're like sharing time, CPU time, between two different applications. I mean, it's it's a one point eight billion instructions. Do you think this is not possible? Not only that, in my, my case, in, the, in most cases these days actually, eight CPU cores. Uh, granted, it also depends on how the program is implemented. If you, you can have like a, um, if it's implemented using multiple threads or something where you, you can execute it on multiple CPUs. But, but it's possible, to, it's not like you're executing them at the same time, but you have the illusion of thinking that you're executing those things at the same time, but you're not. You can't, at, at any given point in time, you can only do one thing. Fetch the code. Yeah, I guess I... <laughs> the, the one thing I was referring to was the application here. I was saying like when you're sharing time between multiple applications. And I, I've been giving you examples of, if you look at my machine, right? That's a good question, thanks. If I look at my machine and I'll, I'm trying to check how many things are running at my, at my machine, all these things that you're looking at here, these are individual process, processes that are currently running on this machine. A lot of them, right? You just count them actually. Currently I'm running uh, 234 processes. Right, and, 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 and really, maybe, hopefully this will be able to simulate things. Uh, probably not. I was trying to see if I could show you. Right, so you're sharing time with uh, multiple applications. In this case, like the 234 processes because I only have how many process, processors here? Eight, right? And I'm running, right now there are 234 processors that are running. How is it that they're running uh, at the same time? I have the illusion that they're running at the same time, but in actual fact, they're not running at the same time. But because the so-called running is done within like a small period of time, right? And because I can run multiple things in a second, Usually human beings, like it's, you can perceive what a second is, not a millisecond, right? right? Millisecond. You have the illusion of thinking that you're running multiple things at the same time. Uh, but the question to do with uh, instruction fetch and decode and whatnot is kind of uh, somewhat different to what he's saying. But you can, you can link it to, to what we just said. He's saying if you're sharing time, then 
what, what you could say hypothetically here is that, um, and, uh, and for my machine, I could have these things here I'm describing running on those eight different cores, right? CPU cores, because I have eight here. So effectively, I could just assume this is for one application, the other one is for the other application, and the other application. Um, but, but in the case where I have 234 things happening, what I'm saying is those, because I have a finite number of cores, those have to be shared between the different processes that are running. But, but, but obviously, as, as the sharing is happening behind the scenes, this is also happening. Uh, and in the process, you end up executing things uh, at a very fast rate. Oh, my machine is so fast. Why? I bought a brand new iPhone or something, iPhone 10, whatever. And you should be able to explain these things to people, by the way. I think this, I, I, apparently, this is what you, for those of you that will become like me teaching and whatnot, to be, this is what you have to teach people, right? And be able to answer it. But how? I don't know. Yeah. No, they, they are. Huh? It's, not they, it's not an illusion. They are actually happening. It's so maybe you understand once we, we have a discussion of different hardware components. See, observe. Ooh. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> let's say we are executing, uh, let's see. Okay, because the instruction fetch is here, right? Decode, excuse me, write back and whatnot. But, but observe. We are executing, we start with one instruction, the first instruction. The moment you execute that one instruction, the PC, which is a hardware component, will be updated by, uh, by what? The address of the next instruction that you need to execute. <laughs> At the point when you're updating the PC with the next instruction to execute, there's nowhere else where you can put the, that value on to execute, you understand? But once you're done with that stage, once you're done with that stage, uh, and you're decoding the instruction, what, you can, what, what, you're, what, what you're actually doing is you know that things like the, the ADA, the instruction memory components, is instruction memory, variation, data memory, you know that this is not doing anything. This is not doing anything. So if these things are not doing anything, when we are decoding, we might as well do the next thing that we need to do. Because the hardware components involved are not doing anything at this point in time. In the next clock cycle, when you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be like instruction execute, you know that the register file is free, things like the sign extend that's here is free, so you might as well use these to process the thing that is here. As you're doing that, you're, like you're doing multiple things at the same time. Uh, but, 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 but really, uh, granted, this doing multiple things at the same time only becomes apparent when you're processing maybe not just one instruction, but perhaps think about it from the perspective of you're processing two instructions. Let's say second cycle, third cycle, better yet, look at it from the perspective of you, uh, uh, or what happens when you execute completely two instructions. How many cycles would you have gone through? What would you have been doing, right? In here, you are dealing with, uh, because you're just starting, you just loaded the program into RAM, you fetch the first one, the first instruction, you fetch it from memory, first cycle. In the second cycle, you realize that when you're decoding it, the things involved with fetching are free. So as you are decoding, fetch the second one. So it's not an illusion, it's actually happening. The illusion is the running two applications at the same time. There's no such thing. Maybe what we should do next, uh, I don't know if there's a dedicated, I don't think you have a dedicated course on operating systems. There's usually, usually there has to be a compromise on what, what you give up, right? Relative to what you should cover most. And we decided to give up our discussion of, an in-depth in discussion of operating systems. If we had gone a step further, maybe people would probably have understood um, the importance of some of the things we're talking about here, but, you know, scheduling and um, threading and all those things, the fancy things that they do. And unfortunately for you guys, I think when you're taught how to program, 
you know, really just uh, your interest, everything is, is abstracted. I think the programming is mostly, makes, mostly assumes that you're going to be writing programs, um, writing, writing application software programs, right? If that makes sense. So you, you don't really care about things like memory management, which is what the average programmer does these days. Because you say the operating system is going to do that for me. Why? One of the key things of the operating system, what does it do? Memory management. So you just write your program and you say the operating system, wherever it's going to be installed, will handle memory management. But for people that are writing, that are obsessed with writing efficient code, you need to think about how you can, you know, um, you can take advantage of multi-threading, for instance. How you can design a program so that it runs on multiple CPU cores if the machine um, has multiple CPU cores. But that's irrelevant, that's besides the point, I guess. Okay, so if this, this is making sense, um, I guess we we'll just, uh, as we're transitioning to discuss the different hardware components, guys, I thought, um, I thought we'd, we'd just briefly discuss, and it's like, I guess, still have, oh, still have a bit of time, I guess. Um, I guess, uh, I thought we'd discuss something that we deliberately omitted from when we are looking at these so-called instructions, right? Just brief recap here, we're saying uh, MIPS instructions. Um, they're encoded in binary format, obviously, are ones and zeros, stream of, so one instruction is a stream of TG2 ones and zeros. And we can, we can really interpret what, what those one, what, what, what that particular instruction does by just looking at the bit pattern, right? From left to right. Um, the two bits in size. Um, and something else we discussed was that uh, for the most part, not all the time, but for the most part, uh, a typical MIPS instruction would be composed of um, the operation that you need to perform and operands, right? So the opcode and operands, essentially. Add $8, comma, $9, comma, $10, right? But when you look at the instruction from left to right, it turns out that the, um, that the, uh, well, this is uh, 32 bits, obvious, zero to 31 here. We'll talk about this for a second. We, we, also, we also gain an appreciation of how those bits are actually segmented for, the, for these three different types of instructions, right? We know that uh, the first six bits are always the opcode for all the three types of instructions, but when you start dealing with, let's say, the J formatted instruction, then you know that the remaining um, 26 bits would be for the target address where you're jumping to, right? Um, different things happen for the I formatted instruction where op, you have opcode and then you have a, a source register, target register, and then the last 16 bits would be your immediate, um, immediate value, right? <clears throat> uh, difference comes in with R formatted instruction where you have things like, uh, you know, shift amounts, you have the destination register, and then the fun code. Fun code is there because this is always <laughs> Uh, six, six zeros for, for the alpha formatted instruction. <clears throat> right. But it turns out that, uh, that in fact there's a fixed format associated to these different segments we're talking about here, right? And we, we omitted this discussion deliberately. We thought it would be appropriate where when we started talking about uh, the data path, right? It turns out that um, for the op code, Bit position number 31 all the way up to bit position number 26 is, is what's reserved for the opcode, right? So it's like you're moving from 31 to zero this side. This is going to become important once we start tracing the instructions because we'll make the assumption that we know what's happening here. So when you see something like, oh, bit position 25 to 21 and it's an R format instruction, you should immediately know that this is a, um, Source register, number one, or register source, right? Right, so for, specifically for an R format instruction, what we're saying is that, sure, we understand and appreciate the fact that uh, opcode is uh, six bits, but again, to add on to that, what we're saying is that, in fact, the opcode is represented by bit position number 26 all the way up to 31. Think for a second here. You remember our discussion of so-called buses, right? These are actually wires, right? They're like wires where this thing is going to be transmitted to. Do you understand what I mean? Right? It gives you like it's remember one hundred zero is just an, a high voltage or low voltage, right? So if it's 
if it's if if you're transmitting high voltage or low voltage, it has to be transmitted somewhere. This is what we're saying. It's like a it's like a, a wire associated with the bus or something. You can think of it as that way. But what we're saying is this is a 26-1 is the op code. And then bit position 21 up to 25 or 25 to 21 would be the source register. Right? Uh, and really, I mean, you can easily derive uh, these things that follow through afterwards because, because you, know, you know how many bits are reserved for the different segments, um, depending on whether you're dealing with an R format instruction or an I format instruction. Right? So 31 to 26, 25 to 21, 20 to 16, 15 to 11, 10 to 6, 5 to 0. So fan code is always represented by bit position 0 up to bit position number 5. is what we are saying here. Um, and then so the same goes for this uh, so-called I formatted instruction. The, obviously the bit positions for the opcode are going to be the same as 26 to 31, right? Um, and also for the source register or RS is going to be the same, same as the R formatted instruction. It's bit position 25 to 21, but well, same goes for the target uh, uh, register, which is bit uh, position 20 to 16, but the difference comes in in the uh, things that are represented by the immediate values from 15 to zero, right? Um, um, and then finally for the J format, it's essentially just same for the opcode 31 to 26, and then bit position 25 all the way up to, I think people got the timing wrong here. Meeting was 14 hours, you are late. Uh, B position 25 to zero would be the jump address. And these things will come up a lot, by the way, so putting it together, essentially. I'll just quickly fast forward briefly here. This will come up a lot when we start our discussion of this, right? Trying to understand when you strip the, this is an IR format instruction, when you strip it, what's actually happening here, so, right? So you, you should be able to, you want to understand these bit positions for you to be able to, to follow through with what we're going to be discussing when we're saying, this is what's happening when you're dealing with, uh, with the um, instruction data, for instance, when we're dealing with the register file, this is a register file, right? This is why it's important, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, getting back here, uh, I guess just to wrap up or set the stage for what we're going to talk about tomorrow, uh, what we're saying really is that uh, the so-called data path and control is nothing more than we, we are trying to to get an understanding of how exactly the different hardware components get to be, or get to function as you're executing the instruction. This is why we are studying this part, right? Um, so what actually happens when you're executing add i, add sub, mod, um, b, bgt, and things of that nature, right? And like I said, our discussion beginning tomorrow is going to focus on the, the key hardware components, right? So it's primarily we're going to look at what happens to these, these hardware components as we're executing an R format instruction, I format instruction, or a J format instruction. All right, if there are no questions, then I guess we'll call it a day, and we'll continue. What? Why would you say yes, honestly? <laughs> Why do people don't want to learn, right? Question? We, sorry, we are continuing with the thing. I made a mistake, it's two hours. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, it's your fault, the replication. Yeah, we're continuing here. Why? Why? Well, you're free to go. I mean, it's, it's a free country, right? But it's not like you lose marks if you don't, we don't give marks here. There was a question, sir. Yes. Which diagram? Yeah, that one. Yeah. IF is instruction fetch, instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute, EX. ME is like you're accessing memory, so it's memory. And then write back is you're writing to a register. I guess I'll put a, a lookup table somewhere. Instruction fetch, instruction deca decode, execute. Sorry? <laughs> instruction fetch. Uh, is, IF is instruction fetch. I'll, <laughs> ID is instruction decode, EX is execute, memory access, and then write back, you're writing to a register. The I is, um, I just lifted this from Wikipedia actually. The I is, uh, 
Wiki Commons, not Wikipedia. The eyes, it's, the images are free there, it's not plagiarism. The eyes, um, I forgot though to, the licensing, right? You remember the licensing we discussed, Creative Commons and whatnot? This is Creative Commons attribution, so I must attribute, which is why most of my images I have a link, right? That's attribution, but I shall change this. We are recording. I shall change this so that um, the source is attributed. I is the instruction. So this represents instruction number one, number two, number three, number four, which is why the arrow shows you the number of instructions they're dealing with going down. The T is for time. Time is in the different cycles, right? 5.5 .5, uh, times E to the power 10, cycle number one from your machine. Uh, so as you are moving here, the cycles increase, right? Um, and as you're going down, the things that you're processing increase instructions. There was a question. You had your hand up before. Oh, no. hi. Yeah. Ah, you came late. Late comers eat bones, right, or something. I don't know. I don't know if that's a Zambian saying or something. No, we were just making a, a distinction, a, a comparison between a single, uh, and it's, it's a good thing that we're regurgitating this because maybe some people did not understand this, but we were trying to draw a comparison between so-called single cycle CPU data path and multiple cycle CPU data path or pipeline data path. This is pipeline, this is a single cycle. So in a single cycle data path, what happens is that you, execute one instruction at a time. Well, you execute an instruction and only transition to the next instruction once you're done with that fetch decode execute cycle. So in any, in any, any given CPU cycle, it's either you're fetching, decoding, executing, accessing memory, or writing to a register. This is, this is what happens, right? So uh, like each clock cycle, you're doing this thing here, this thing, this thing, this thing. So in a single cycle data path, what you're doing is for each instruction, you go through these different phases one at a time. So when you're executing this instruction, you will first of all fetch it, you will decode it in the second cycle, you will execute it in the third cycle, you access memory if you need be in the fourth cycle, you write to a register in the fifth cycle, right? Write back. Only when you are done with these five phases associated with this one instruction, will you transition to the second instruction, right? But for a pipeline data path, a multi-cycle data path, what you're doing is you're saying, because the things that the components that are involved with these different phases are different, when you're, when you're done with fetching an instruction for this one instruction, the things you're using, the hardware components involved with fetching the instruction will, will not be doing anything. Well, they'll essentially be free. You have free resources there. So the argument is that when you're decoding the first instruction, what you could do is you could fetch the, fe the second instruction. When you're executing the first instruction, you can decode the second instruction and also fetch the third instruction. When you are accessing memory, for the first instruction. What you could do is you could then execute the second instruction, decode the third instruction, and might as well fetch the fourth instruction. When you are writing back whatever results you have for the first instruction, might as well access memory if need be for the second instruction, execute the third instruction, decode the fourth instruction, might as well fetch the fifth instruction. And then the cycle continues. Never ending cycle here, like Sisyphus or something. Is this fine? Do you understand this? We are glossing over this really important concept. If you read up, if you just go online, you notice that there's a ton of literature written on this. We just want to get an appreciation of what's happening to the instructions, to rub it in that uh, they are not actually executed one at a time here. Yes? The, but it is. The same thing. So. So the same things we discussed when we were looking at the instruction cycle, they still happen, right? You think this, this still happens, but when you, are, when you increment the PC, they're saying increment, when you, you increment the PC when you want to, to transition, you keep track of what you're going to execute next, right? So 
five instructions we have there, right? First one, you fetch it. <clears throat> when you fetch that instruction, the moment you're fetching it, the PC will be updated with the address of the next instruction that you need to fetch. When you are decoding that first instruction, because you want to fetch the second instruction, you're pipelining it, you might as well say, once you fetch the second instruction, update the PC with the third instruction. So the process, this process here still holds, this process is still hold, but it's, it's the sequence of events that changes depending on which, which sort of approach you're, you're, you're using here. This is still holds. This is fundamental, this will never, well, it hasn't changed enough. No. No. A cycle is associated with these different phases. Sure, one complete CPU cycle, complete CPU cycle involves fetching the instruction and executing it. Once you execute it, that's what we are calling as a complete CPU cycle. But within that complete CPU cycle, there are these phases. These phases, every time you transition to the next clock, like if you are, uh, if you are, um, Let's, let's work with a hypothetical. <clears throat> hmm. Let's work with a hypothetical CPU that processes. Um, this, is, this is a one kilohertz CPU, right? Let's work with a hypothetical one kilohertz uh, processor, which processes 1,000 instructions in one second. One kilohertz, 1,000 hertz. You notice that for a 1,000 hertz processor, it will be one over 1,000 seconds, right? Which is essentially just a one millisecond, is it? So if you're working with a processor that that processes that 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 um, takes one millisecond to process to, to, to that has a, well, it takes one millisecond to process an instruction. And we have messed things up here by abstracting here because um, these are not really instructions, you just say, it's supposed to be cycle phase. Hopefully this will, we're changing things here to see if people understand, if, well, Ms. Banda will understand. I'm sure people understand what you're talking about, or some, hopefully. <clears throat> so with a, a processor that, that, has, that oscillates at one kilohertz, what we are saying is each clock cycle takes one millisecond. And one millisecond is quite fast, right? Because one second is like 1,000 milliseconds, but that's besides the point. So for each, uh, each cycle, it's one millisecond, one millisecond, one millisecond, right? What that one millisecond means is that in the first one millisecond, fetch the instruction. Second millisecond, that same instruction you fetch, you decode it. In the third millisecond, execute the instruction. In the fourth, store the instruction. Do you understand this? For you to complete, to execute the instruction, you'd have you need four milliseconds. Is this making some sense now? What was your question again? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. So so each stage takes one. So I was saying the right thing. The next stage takes one millisecond. So that's what the time takes. Yes. The, the cycle is just essentially nothing more than the rate at which, um, the, the cycle is associated with, with that 
the thing associated with your processor is say, well, my phone is, uh, is it 2.5 gigahertz, right? Meaning that the cycles that can be processed in any second are 2.5 billion cycles. 2.5 of this, this, this. But, but again, we're simplifying things because it turns out that the cycles don't, well, I guess it's fine. So 2.5 billion of such things happening in any given second. So for you to figure out how things work, what time is related to each of these different phases, you'd need to figure out how long it takes for you to, how much time it takes for you to process this one phase, which is why I say for a hypothetical one kilohertz processor, it's one millisecond. One millisecond decode. So for a single, single CPU cycle data path, it will, it will be like, um, it would be like um, single, single cycle data path where, um, which, which uses, which, which has a processor that oscillates at 1,000 kilohertz. What you're saying is one, sec, one millisecond, two milliseconds, three milliseconds, four milliseconds, five milliseconds. So after five milliseconds, you'd have finished executing this instruction. And by finishing executing this is, you will find a value of 2019 in register eight after five milliseconds. Once you're done with the five milliseconds, in the 60th millisecond, you, you go and fetch this, six, assume this is six, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. After 10 milliseconds, you would have finished executing instruction number two. But for this, using the same processor, but because this makes use of pipelined uh, data path, CPU data path, multi-cycle CPU data path, what you're saying is in the first millisecond, you fetch the first instruction. In the second millisecond, you decode the first instruction, but at the same time, you're fetching the second instruction. In the third millisecond, you execute the first instruction, but you're decoding the second instruction and fetching the third. In the fourth millisecond, right, you notice that after five milliseconds, you would have taken the same time to execute that one instruction, if it was single or multiple. But in the 60th millisecond, you would have executed two instructions for this particular design, but you'd still not have executed the second instruction for that because, because it's done sequentially. Is this making sense? Yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. After 10 milliseconds, how many instructions have you executed? Two. Come here. One millisecond. Two milliseconds, three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. After ten milliseconds, you'd have executed this five, these five instructions. Which one would you rather have? Something that executes five instructions in ten milliseconds or two instructions in ten milliseconds? I know what I would want anyway, but I don't know about you. But uh, Hi. Yeah. So take the, for example, using that same hypothetical instruction, yeah. it will take six seconds to execute two instructions. Here, rather than, yes. Rather than the thing that was taken. For one, one. yes. Uh, but, but it takes, uh, uh, this, is, this is interesting. I was asking, say, so it will take six seconds to execute two instructions here. Um, but it takes, t it takes uh, 20 actually for, is it two or 10, sorry, for this one, yeah. right? So six by two. But for you to uh, run this program, like in this case, it takes, or you were saying, uh, his question was, uh, so using the same hypothetical scenario where we're working with a one kilohertz CPU, would it then, would, would, would it be correct for us to say it takes five, sec, five, five uh, milliseconds to execute one, one instruction, but six, six here to execute two? So yes. But it still takes to execute one instruction. It's the same. 
Takeaway point here is that you only get to appreciate the power of this when you are working with multiple instruction. If you, if you had a program that had one instruction, do you think it would matter whether you are, you are using single, you're using this approach or that approach? No. It's, it's like uh, having more RAM. If, my, if I bought my machine just so I can run, I can type Microsoft Word, why, why would I even go and buy 12 GB of RAM? If I'm just, I just use Word, it's just Word, I come to the office, open Word and just start typing. That's all I do. Why would you need more RAM, right? It defeats the purpose. You only start leveraging more RAM when you're running multiple applications, like you said, playing a video here. I don't know what people do these days. Maybe running background processes here. You have your browser open there. Uh, I don't know what else people do here, right? But so then you need more RAM because the more RAM you have, the more things you can push into RAM. And it becomes much faster and easier for the CPU to fetch them from RAM. In all these different instances we're talking about here, whenever we're making reference to efficiency, you only get, get an appreciation of efficiency when you're running multiple things at the same time, when you're running things simultaneously, not just one thing. Is this fine? Guys, uh, I will see you when you see me, which is tomorrow bright and early. Ah, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I had a, an announcement here. I don't know if I spoke about this. It's, we shall meet from Unzasek 2 still. So we still continue meeting. We still continue with this because I think once we transition to the next lecture series, we might need to, to there's a tool that's already on Moodle called Logism or something. We might need to maybe work with Logism. I don't know if we'll have time to do that. We might. I do hope we do have time. And so we need access to the lab. It's already installed there actually, I think. I think it was installed, so. Maybe not, I don't know. If not, then, okay. So if there are no more questions, then I'll see you when you see me, which is tomorrow. Unless there are questions. Is, are, are we, have we gotten to a stage where, because we're almost wrapping up here, have we gotten to a stage where we now understand how a computer works? Yes. No? What do you mean somehow? We've been at it for eight months now, right? Seven, almost seven now. No? Can, can I ask a question before, you, as we are leaving, right? The impressions on the le last lecture series were, was the MIPS thing, was it, was it very hard? Sorry? The, the discussion on MIPS, was it, was it complex? Yes. Hmm. It's uh, the people doing maths. I'm sure there are things in maths that are more complex than what we're talking about, right? <laughs> is that? Or is this, I guess the question I'm, I'm asking is, is this more complex than the other courses that we are doing? Yes. No. Yes. No. Complexity is good. <laughs> what question? Sorry, pause for you. What questions? But why would you do them if you don't know what to do? Now, someone just commented here saying, when he's practicing using MIPS assembly, right? He finds himself doing certain things that he, he doesn't even understand, he's just doing them. You must study so that you understand why you're doing them. Now, if, if, if this would be some consolation, when I first started programming myself, year number two of my stay here, uh, I started second. There were things, right, where you, <laughs> You just, you know how association, right? If I put my hand here, then and I stop, then I'll burn it or something. So I must not do this. It's like you're linking things. Um, it took time for me to understand certain concepts. That's what I'm trying to say. 
Uh, but with more practice, when you're practicing, when you practice more and more, you force yourself to understand why you're doing something. So uh, the response I have to that is, you want to practice more. And if you come across something that you don't understand, just look it up. The re one of the reasons we're using MIPS is because there's an abundant amount of resources online, a lot, more than you can chew actually. Just Google, Google up MIPS assembly language programming and you'll be shocked, right? Because it turns out that this is a, whenever you're uh, doing a computer architecture course, this is predominantly, this is what is used for beginners, right? But for more advanced levels, like if you're doing uh, a computer architecture course, let's say at graduate school, for instance, you probably be using like x86, for instance, right? But, but for, for me, for, for thing, lower levels, like first year, second year, MIPS. So you imagine this, each, comp each university that offers a computing oriented course that deals with architecture has resources on MIPS. And you have free access to the internet. There's no excuse here for not being able to, it's like a, there's no resources, there's nothing in the library. No, everything is there online. Free internet access, go figure. Yes, a question. Yeah, so there's a question here that uh, you had somewhere that most computer systems that use MIPS architectures are embedded systems. That is true um, to a certain extent, just because of the limited instruction set that you get to work with. Why embedded systems? You remember a key trait of embedded systems? They're more or less like single function devices. You remember the embedded system I brought? So if, if you have that Zesco customer interface unit, for instance, it does very basic things. Why would you want to use like a complex, a sys-based uh, architecture? It defeats the purpose. So the reason why most embedded systems do that is because those are like single function devices that make use of embedded devices. So you're doing just one thing. Compare and contrast with the machine like this where you have to run multiple software packages, do crazy things, right? So yeah. Could be a legacy issue as well. Till we meet again tomorrow. Test on October 13th. 11th.